Now, if you live with someone who snores, you know that it can range from a bit of a family joke to a really debilitating issue that might even make you sleep in separate bedrooms. But why do some people snore when others don't? And is there anything you can do to stop or at least reduce the rumbling? With me on the line today is Dr. Alison Bentley, who is one of this country's foremost experts on sleep problems. She was the founding chair of the Sleep Society of South Africa. She's also served on the governing council of the World Association of Sleep Medicine. She consults to Restonic as a sleep expert and has developed several training courses in this field. In other words, she really knows her stuff. Dr. Alison Bentley, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us. That's a great pleasure. Thank you. A lot of people just assume it's normal to snore, but it's not actually meant mm. to happen, is it? No, it's not. I mean, snoring is, is not normal. I think it it kind of normalizes because everybody knows an older man that snores. And so you <laughs> kind of go, well, it's normal because everybody does. But it's never, it's never actually normal to snore. But it doesn't... But it also doesn't mean that snoring is necessarily a medical condition. Okay, so, okay. I mean, if you snore, what, what, it, what it means is that the air going down the back of your throat, from your nose, so through your nose, down the back of your throat, into your lungs, it's just not moving in a nice, smooth, kind of calm way. Mm-hmm. It's kind of getting a bit interfered with, so there's a bit of an obstruction somewhere. And, I mean, for older men, I mean, we're talking over the age of 40, it's often because they've just put on some weight. Okay. So, and, and when men put on weight, they put it on around their neck, chest area. So if you put it on around your neck, then what you're doing to that whole airway is just narrowing it down a bit. And so if it's a little bit narrower, air is moving a little bit faster, you're more likely to snore. It can be something as simple as that. Sometimes, mm. though, it's, it's, it's an actual physical obstruction of some sort, though, isn't it? Yeah. So the, so the snoring is a partial obstruction. Like if you're moving air, you, move, you can make a noise. It becomes a problem when that obstruction that is just interfering with the airflow as such starts actually becoming a problem where you it's it's such a severe obstruction that it's, uh, your airflow is uh, your air, airway is actually closing off yeah so that it it collapses in on itself and that happens behind the palate so the baby tongue at the back of the throat kind of kicks back or the tongue itself moves back with, with the jaw and just closes off the airway and that's when it turns into apnea and that's a much more important issue medically certainly yeah. So we kind of, the snoring is noise pollution and it's a bed partner and, and, and all of that. And yes, we can, we can if, you know, all snorers, we can get some resolution of snoring from, it, from Hallelujah. that. Hallelujah. But when it, yeah, but when it turns into apnea, then we kind of go, now this is now a medical problem yeah. because during the night when you're asleep, your throat collapses. I think it's important the language that we use because people tend to say, oh, apnea is where you stop breathing during sleep. And that's kind of sinister to think that yeah. you trust your brain to like do its thing while you're asleep and it might not do it, that it might stop breathing. So you don't ever stop breathing, but you do stop moving air, and that's different. So the throat collapses, your chest carries on trying to breathe, but you just don't, are not unable right. to move any air through the throat. And the problem is, that's a problem because obviously the oxygen level in your blood kind of tends to just go down a little bit. Yeah. But then at the end of that apnea, at some point your brain has to wake you up to start moving here again. And it's that wake up. So you wake up, a little surge of adrenaline. People who have apnea often wake up saying, I wake up with my heart racing. Yes. A little bit sweaty, um, feeling a bit breathless. Um, and, and sometimes confuse it with a panic attack, like feel they're having a panic attack at night. But it's that wake up from, from the apnea. Now, you know, the numbers that you can get with sleep apnea are huge. Um, moderate sleep apnea, you know, is between 15 and 30 times per hour. Oh, my sleep. gosh. So, I mean, even if you pick 20 as a random number and you have eight hours of sleep, that means it's 160 times that your brain had to pull you out of sleep to start breathing again. And obviously that means the next day you feel the effects of 120 times you got wo- or 160 yeah. times you got woken up at night. And so people with sleep apnea typically wake up feeling, having got the hours, but wake up feeling as though they haven't had the hours, that they, they're still sleepy, they're still tired in the morning. And it's really important to define that it's a quality of sleep issue. Yeah. You know, that they kind of go, I've had the sleep, but I don't feel like I've had the sleep. So then that's, that's what sleep apnea does to your sleep usually. So that's sleep apnea. Now, you've said, you know, mm. th- that's something you need to obviously investigate and look for solutions you because do. nobody can carry on functioning with that kind of interrupted sleep on an ongoing well, basis, can they? Yeah, and the problem, yeah, no, and the problem, no, absolutely. And the problem is that you've no idea. We actually don't know just from how, the symptoms that you have, we don't know how bad it is. And there is a level over which, and, and that's 20 per hour that we look at. And if you stop breathing more than 20 times an hour, 
we can quite constantly say, listen, you have a, this is now interfering with every other function in the body. Mm. So it's increasing your risk of cardiovascular disease, of diabetes, dementia, depression, everything you can possibly think of. Because you're just not restoring. So the body's designed, I mean, pretty much like a car, it has to have a service. Okay? Yes. We have a service every night. So when we go to sleep, we regenerate, restore, so that when we wake up in the morning, we can start spending again, really, mm. on it. And if you don't restore, if you just restore maybe only 80%, that's 20% you haven't restored. Now the next night is another 80%. Now you're 40% down and so on and so yeah. on and so on. So you just never get that restorative sleep. And so you can understand that the, everything that that sleep is designed to do that is not happening, everything's kind of running down. Okay. So, Alison, yeah. distinguishing between the two then very clearly, the sleep apnea, obviously mm. a serious medical condition that needs yeah, investigating absolutely. and monitoring and intervention yeah. versus the snoring that's inconvenient and perhaps impacts your partner's yeah. quality of sleep as well. Exactly. Um, how, do you, I mean, how do you tell which, which you're suffering from? Is it going to be in the symptoms of, of feeling tired the next day, yeah. etc.? So we, we, we use a mnemonic, um, in medicine schools with mnemonics, like how do you remember all these symptoms? Yes. <laughs> so, and the mnemonic is stop bang. So that's what we look at. And, and so the stop, so if there's snoring, so start with snoring. Yeah. The P is tiredness during the day. The O is observed apnea. So has anybody seen that you stop breathing, right? Wife, fishing buddies, whoever right. it is. The P of stop stands for high blood pressure. So if you have a high blood pressure, very likely to have sleep apnea. The bang is, is the BMI, so if you're overweight, so yeah. over the BMI over 30, per, um, so that's a calculation that you can do about weight. The A is for age over 50. The N is for next circumference. So it's, uh, women don't know about their next circumferences. Men do because that's how they buy shirts. <laughs> so they buy shirts like 43 yeah. long or 44 wide or that's 43, 44. That's the next circumference. Over 43, increased risk. And the G, the last one, is men. So there's eight kind of symptoms that we look at. If you score five out of eight, there's an 80% chance you have sleep apnea. So those are the kind of, we use these kind of questionnaires to kind of go, is it just snoring or is it apnea? You know, but but we still get it wrong. (laughs) I still see patients in, like, I'm sure you've got sleep apnea, and they come back and go, nope, no sleep apnea there. I go, (laughs) actually just snoring. And maybe the the, the tiredness that they have during the day is from something else. So, you know, tiredness during the day is like every medical Every medical disease, exactly. <laughs> tiredness as a or fatigue as a thing. So it's not necessarily always to do with sleep apnea, but okay. usually somebody's told you that you stop breathing at night, and that's a real kind of slam dunk. Like then yeah. you do have apnea. We do the test to go, how bad is it? How much do we need to worry about it? And then obviously the higher it is, and I mean I'm talking about moderate up to thirty. I write reports for studies that we do, and every week. At 60 per hour, there will be at least somebody at 60 per hour. Oh, so the numbers yeah. get absolutely huge, like 400 times a night yeah. that, 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 you know, this thing happens. So it's, the numbers can be very large. And once you get there, it's really important to treat that. Okay. Alison, Monique has hit on something quite important here, I think, because we've been talking a lot about men. And I have to mm. say and stick my hand up that I am one of the women who will admit to occasional snoring. And um, I'm sure there are lots of us. Monique's question mm. is, I'm 48 and I've started snoring all of a sudden this winter. My hubby is not impressed. Any explanations yes. and advice on how to restore the quiet harmony? The age might be a, a, an indicator there because isn't this mm. something that women experience with menopause? Absolutely. That's what I was going to say. So mm. it is absolutely a menopause thing. And partly because when you go into menopause, you start producing more testosterone than you do estrogen. Okay. okay. I think that's partly why six year old women just don't give a damn anymore. <laughs> 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 so, and, and the, the testosterone in men is what increases their risk of sleep apnea. Right. So it increases our risk. But if we run, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is run through the five or six kind of factors that we kind of, these are the things that might cause snoring. Okay. So the one is age, about which I can do nothing. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's age. The older you get, the, the muscle tone of your throat obviously gets less. And so it's, and, and I always kind of say to patients, you've got wrinkles on the outside, you've got wrinkles on the inside. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's how that works. So that I can do nothing. But then we go through these factors. So it's body position. Yeah. So it's usually worse when you lie on your back. Snoring is. Then it's ENT, and so that's any obstruction that you might have in your nose mm-hmm. or your throat, your tonsils, your tonsils and adenoids, that kind of thing. So anything like that can increase your risk of, of snoring and sleep apnea. And for winter, so when it gets to winter, 
There's no question that, particularly in Johannesburg, the air is too dry, too cold, too too high, too polluted. Right. And so in winter, your nose gets inflamed. And just that little inflammation, which narrows the airway, the nasal passages, can be enough to start snoring. So Interesting. that's Monique's problem, is that her nose has got a bit irritated. So that's ENT. So we've got position ENT. Then we have weight. Mm-hmm. Then we have reflux, so gastric reflux. So if you have heartburn. Yeah. So when you lie down, the acid can run up um, to the back of the throat, to the back of the tongue, and obviously irritate the back of the tongue, cause it to swell and cause the snoring, be the obstruction. And then the last one is the jaw. So often people will say they grind their teeth and they snore and they grind their teeth. And so grinding your teeth can be a way of the body trying to keep your jaw forward and not allow it to drift backwards and close off. So those are five kind of areas that we look for when you kind of going, somebody started snoring, what could we and where could we focus the treatment on? Yeah. It's those five areas and often more than one. So it might be that people go, I have a bit of reflux and my nose is a little thing. So we go, steroid spray for the nose, let's just calm your nose down, stop it being so inflamed during winter. Take a bit of Gaviscon before you go to bed and let's see what happens to the snoring. Okay. Alison, in closing, I mean, a lot of people are asking the same question on the WhatsApp line. What can we do to reduce the snoring? You've mentioned body positions, so trying to encourage the person to sleep on their side rather than their back is one thing that can help. You've mentioned nasal sprays if it is an inflammation-driven process. Is there anything else you can do? Can you change the bed or the number of pillows that you use? So it it can be about head position. There's no question. So there are a bunch of pillows that are called anti-snoring pillows. And what they do is it stop you from kind of putting your chin inwards towards the back, towards your spine, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. and rather pushing your chin upwards. So what the paramedics would call the recovery position, yes. you know, and opening up your throat. So often have a little bump behind the neck and allowing the head to move backwards a bit to open up the throat. Yes. So certainly that. You certainly need to have a decent bed so that you don't wake up in pain every morning. Like that would help. Yeah. Um, so, so there, there are things that you can do. So body position, honestly, what we do is something called the tennis ball technique. Um, there's actually research on the tennis ball technique. <laughs> and that is, it's literally as simple as getting, I don't use a tennis ball, but I, I use those plastic golf balls. You know the, pra- the practice golf balls? Yes. And they've got holes in them. And you just take that ball and you sew it into whatever you're wearing at night. So a T-shirt right between your shoulder blades. Sew it in there. So that when you turn over from your right-hand side onto your back, it's uncomfortable and you just keep moving on to the left-hand side. So there's, there's, honestly, there's a lot of easy, relatively cheap solutions that you can look at. Um, the nasal spray is not that expensive either. Yeah. You can get a mouth guard for your, for your jaw. Um, there's a generic one at this chem called Snore Meds. Okay. You just put it in your mouth and it stabilizes your jaw. So there's a lot of things that you can do that aren't very costly. To, to try and resolve the snoring. There is some hope in that statement for all the people who are messaging there. <laughs> Thank you for that. One last quick question. Um, sure. and, uh, our listener asking whether pregnancy can have any role in snoring. She said, oh, yeah. I started snoring in pregnancy and unfortunately haven't stopped since. Would that be because of weight gain or is there something else going on there? It's often the nose. So often okay. the nose gets stuffy during pregnancy. So it can be the nose. It's, um, it is sometimes the weight gain depends on how much weight you gain. But the importance with snoring and sleep apnea in pregnancy is that one of the big problems we have with pregnancy is, is high blood pressure in pregnancy. Yes. So your blood pressure is measured constantly during, during pregnancy. And as I mentioned in that questionnaire that we use, high blood pressure is a key factor. And so there is a concern that sometimes with snoring and sleep apnea during pregnancy, that, that might make that, the blood pressure higher in pregnancy and contribute to, to you know, problems during pregnancy because of high blood pressure. So snoring in pregnancy is always a thing that you kind of want to go like, just make sure that you're breathing okay, yeah. that there's no apnea, because that might be dangerous for both you and the baby. Dr. Alison Bentley, thank you so much. A fascinating and very practically focused conversation. Really appreciate your contribution this afternoon. Uh, that was Dr. Alison Bentley, founding chairperson of the Sleep Society of South Africa and Restonic Sleep Expert. That's for the time to half past two. Wesley Peterson is at the Eyewitness News Desk with the latest headlines. Good afternoon.